gas siphon attack. It's called the technical and economic realities behind hacking exchanges. Uh, it's a little bit of an intro to gas token and then a story about uh, a bunch of exchange exploits we found last year and then kind of how that all came about and what you can do to protect yourself against it. Um, we're going to start with a, a live demo, so if you guys want to take out your phone and scan this, this is a cryptocurrency or an Ethereum address that's a contract. If you send any money to it, you will, uh, I don't know if you'll get it back, so don't send very much, but it, <laughs> it does uh, print you gas token. So uh, the, the whole point of this talk is about gas token. So if you send a transaction, what you'll do is make yourself $5 in gas token. Um, so you, you will lose $5 if you do this, but you will get it yes, again. So um, try that out if you want. Uh, and while all this is up on the screen, I'm going to basically take a second to describe what gas token is, what the, the hack was, and then uh, uh, and then we'll go through through how it all, all played out. So it looks like everyone's all done. So, so what this was, what the gas siphon attack was, was an exploit. Uh, Basically, anyone who subsidized costs of Ethereum transactions were vulnerable to this in that uh, someone could uh, use the subsidized payments uh, to print out gas token. And, and gas token is this mechanism, uh, let me take a step back. In Ethereum, there's a mechanism in which you can be rewarded for refunding uh, or removing state from the network. And so when you remove state from the network, what the Ethereum does is it pays you back in, in uh, gas refunds. Uh, and what this attack is, is taking advantage of those, those refunds that, uh, that are built into the Ethereum ecosystem. And so in order to execute this kind of attack, uh, it's, it's very simple. You deploy a contract, we'll go over in a minute, or in the same kind of contract you guys just transacted with. Um, you initiate a withdrawal from an exchange or from someone who pays for your transaction fees. Uh, you send the, the withdrawal to this contract, and the contract does its magic, and then at the end of the, the transaction, you get minted gas token, and the, the money comes straight from the exchange, uh, independent of your actual holding uh, on the exchange. Uh, and a little background about myself. So uh, myself and, and Chris are co-founders of the Gas Siphon Attack. Uh, so, so we kind of found this and, and helped uh, bring it to the attention of the public. Uh, I'm also co-founder of Authorium, uh, which is a wallet provider and data logging solution, as well as Zero Trust, which is an auditing firm, and we audit a bunch of smart contracts. Um, this is a little definition of gas token, but like I said, it's basically a token that represents a refund on the Ethereum network. Uh, the refund is in gas, and the idea being if you spend 100,000 gas on a transaction, you can use this refund to actually only pay 50,000. And there's reasons it exists that we'll get into in a minute. Um, and, and one big question I always get is, says, is gas token good? So uh, is it good to offer someone an incentive to clear the state on the network? Um, and it sounds like a good idea. The reason it exists in Ethereum is because uh, the developer should uh, create state on the network and then clear the state later on so that uh, it, the, the chain's not as big. So the incentive is, is there, but the problem is people are starting to use it for bad. Um, they're hoarding gas tokens that they're bloating the state so that in the future when, when the network is, is uh, very bloated and gas is very expensive, they can get these refunds at, at a much uh, more efficient price. Uh, and so, so the, the idea of gas token is a very good idea. The implementation, as we've seen it, isn't so good, so uh, we'll see how it plays out in the end. Um, and, and how people are using gas tokens today, uh, a, lot, a lot has to do with arbitrage. So the idea being, if I want to make a transaction on Uniswap and, and make some arbitrage through exchanges, uh, and I might have a dollar profit to be made, someone else with gas token might be able to make that same transaction. And what they can do is use gas token, and like I said, it, it reduces the fees. Uh, I'm sorry, the gas costs, and so what that $1 now turns into $1.10 for someone. And when that happens, they, they've now effectively uh, gotten an advantage at arbitrage that no one else who doesn't have gas token does. So, so it's pretty dangerous in that sense. Uh, that's usually pretty well coupled with front running. So a lot of people do front running and gas token arbitrage in the same vein, uh, and it, it works for them. It, no one really knows how it really affects the network. Um, finally, exchanges can use gas token as kind of a hedge or gas futures. So you can imagine if exchanges print a bunch of gas token now or uh, in the future when, when gas is very expensive, they might be able to, to even that out by 
basically having bought and gas futures now so that when the network's clogged, they can still provide their customers with a very constant uh, uh, gas price. Um, I'm going to run through the code real quick via the gas token. It's, it's quite simple, and you don't really need to understand code to understand this. Um, but here, here's the whole contract you just interacted with. Um, and there's only four functions. So, so here's a set min rate, set min rate. And all this does is set a rate of tokens you want to mint. So this would say you'd use to mint five tokens per transaction. So that when you withdrew from a, from an exchange, you'd mint five tokens. And you can change this. And the higher the rate, the higher your gas limit of the transaction would be. Um, the actual mint function, uh, again, this is just a to token. It's an ERC20 token. And so you just call token.mint and then the number of tokens that you pass in. Um, so that's also very simple. This is the fallback function, so the, the reason this works with exchanges is when you don't provide data to a transaction, uh, the uh, contract automatically calls the fallback function. In this case, it is mint. So now it takes it calls the mint function given the mint rate you previously provided. You don't need to do anything. The exchange now is basically paying for you. Um, and finally, you can withdraw the token. So, so the tokens will live on the, on the contract, and then you withdraw them. Uh, and so this is just transferring the tokens out as well as uh, I think either there's some in there. So it's very simple to execute this. It's, it's uh, dangerously simple, some would say. But it's all good. Um, here is uh, an example transaction. Um, and then you probably can't see this, but it's an ether scan contract and this is a withdrawal from an exchange. And uh, it's a withdrawal of 0.01 ether, so not, nothing too crazy. But if you look here, there's a transaction fee of $34 or 0.2 Ether, effectively. And the gas limit is six and a half million. And so this is from a big exchange. And it basically went straight to the contract. And uh, the, the exchange paid six and a half million gas at uh, a 30 gigawatt gas price for free. And, and what people can do with this is now take advantage of it and print gas token. So this is the first transaction we did when, when finding the exploit. And so it's a. You, you can look it up if you want, but it's, it's pretty dangerous. And so who is affected by this? Um, exchanges like we've just been talking about. Uh, meta transaction relayers who subsidize gas costs. This can kind of be scoped out to just anyone who subsidizes gas costs. If someone's paying for your gas or for your transactions, there's a really, really good chance that you can print gas token on their dime. Um, so if any of you are doing this, just watch out for this. You can set limits to the transactions, but we'll go over that in a minute. Um, in any really EVM-based chain that, that uh, again, subsidizes the transactions and has this kind of mechanism built into it. Uh, how can they fix it? Don't pay for users' gas. Um, I know it's a really nice UX to be able to pay for your users' gas, but if you are paying for gas, they are going to try to take advantage of the free money. And this is one of the best ways for them to do it. Um, now, getting into a lot of pictures and, and a lot more interactive stuff. So, here is a bunch of pictures of, of mobile wallets. So, this is, you can't see it here, but Trust Wallet, Coinbase, and MetaMask. And what, what, why these exist is because I'm showing you that they don't, they try to abstract gas away from users. And when they do this, they, they make the user vulnerable. So, you can see here, they have this concept of network fee, network fee, uh, transaction fee. Um, and, and users, uh, can almost guarantee you most of you don't look at that too closely. And But what these are saying is, hey, I'm sending 0.001 ETH, but the fee here you see is $3.85. And if, if you're just clicking and you think this is a normal transaction, you're not going to see $3.85. Uh, it could also be $30 or up to $300 maybe. Um, and, and you're going to basically pay that. And, and you're going to have no idea because you're going to see 0.01 ETH. And I don't know if there's a good answer. These wallets are all trying to abstract the, the gas away from their user, and, and that's a really good idea. But on the same, at the same time, it's, it's also dangerous. Um, this is also Argent, and, and the reason it's by itself is because they, they kind of do it the worst in that they say it's free, it's paid by Argent. So they don't even give the user the idea that, that there is a fee associated with the transaction, and it's dangerous. It's nice, but it's dangerous. And so it, it's just something to look out for. Um, and then going into to what we actually did last year, so, so the <laughs> hack happened, or the, the exploit happened last year at DEF CON around this time, um, and we were uh, basically realized that could, every exchange was vulnerable to an extent. So some exchanges you could have taken $50, million, or, sorry, $50 per transaction from, some $2, but if you write a script, you can basically take a, a million transactions. 
Um, and so when we found this, we went to one of the more prominent members of the Ether community, and when he realized what this was, he basically said, he smiled and he said, oh, well, code is law, and he walked away, uh, meaning you guys should take all the money and run. But it's a lot of the exchanges are, are interesting jurisdictions and we didn't really want to deal with that. So we decided to work with different people to kind of get this resolved. We got in touch with all the exchanges and um, what you'll see here, and, and we figured, hey, we'll, we'll be the good guys and maybe we'll collect some bug bounties for this. We'll put in a lot of work, but we'll, we'll get paid a little bit. And so here's an example of, of one of the exchanges bounty pages. Uh, you don't need to read it, but what, what is good to see is says, uh, if you find an extraordinarily severe issue, we can pay you up to $100,000. And so we did the math, uh, could have taken 10 million from them, that's pretty severe, they would have stopped their exchange, and they can just give us $100,000 instead. Um, and so we worked with them, and we got in touch with all of them, and we had Telegram chats, and more chats, and more chats, and more chats, and more chats. And more chats. And, and it actually went on for a month. And so we, we, all these exchanges, we talked like this for about a month, and it was two to three, maybe even four engineers, almost full-time job for a month. Um, and so this is one exchange in particular. And we got through, got through this whole thing and basically saved them. And they offered $800 worth of their token. Uh, and so that, that was a little frustrating. Uh, <laughs> um, so we responded with a, a very large email, or large telegram message you can read later, but what it's saying is incentives are really hard in this space, um, and you guys are one of the biggest exchanges, and, and this is what you're offering, and if you can't do it right, no one else is going to do it right. Um, I didn't say it, but it, it kind of sounds like next time we find something, we're just going to take the money and give you what we want, but it's hard to explicitly say it, something like this. <laughs> uh, they, they ended up responding. And they gave us much more money, a couple thousand dollars, not anywhere near a hundred thousand dollars, but it, it was something, and, and that's you know, honestly all you can really do with this kind of stuff, unfortunately. Um, this is another example of an exchange, and this one's quite funny. Again, don't read it all, but uh, I'll highlight some things in the, the next slide. But, but what we ended up doing was sending an email to a ton of different exchanges. Uh, it was very hard to get a hold of them, so we basically sent an email to maybe 50 or 100 different people with the same message, hey, um, there's a vulnerability, we can't get in touch with you, but if you get in touch with us, we'll help you out. So we got this email from, from this exchange, and this was the CEO, um, and, and Chris sent the email, and he said, hey, here's who I am, here's what we found, um, we, we think you're vulnerable. Uh, and he responded with, good for you. We are not fraudulent, there's nothing wrong with our security. <laughs> several companies <laughs> and, and that was in response to hey we, we it wasn't we think we know your exchange is vulnerable so uh, that was not a not a good response <laughs> a, nine minutes later uh, we got this email from the same company but this was from an engineer saying oh wow we really appreciate this uh, we'll give you a shout if there's any questions so same company two different people two different responses. Uh, we, uh, I think we ended up sending, forwarding this email to the CEO um, and we never heard from them again. So, uh, so we got them. <laughs> um, so, so that's kind of the, the history of the attack in you know, a gas token, but um, there's a lot of interesting metrics and stuff going on with gas and gas markets and gas tokens now. And, and here's gonna be a bunch of screenshots that kind of describe that uh, in a pretty interesting way. Uh, I'm sure you guys have all seen this, but when Fairwind was going on, the gas prices were, were pretty high. Uh, they're lower now, but I, I assume they'll be higher at some point. Um, when the, these prices are high, people can really start taking advantage of gas tokens. And so if people printed gas tokens when they were cheap, when gas was maybe one gig away, they can now print it, uh, they can now start using this at, at, uh, at a much higher price. Um, this is the block gas limit. Uh, again, this was made about two weeks ago when we were rising the, the block gas limit to about eight and a half. I think we've got up to 10 million. Um, and I think since then it's back down to eight, but, but this is basically showing that gas usage is really increasing on the network and good or bad, maybe it's a Ponzi scheme, maybe we have a lot of actual usage, but, but I, my intuition is that Ethereum is gonna grow and the usage is also gonna grow. Um, this is actually pretty interesting. So, so after the uh, a lot of this stuff stemmed from Phil Dian's talk at last DevCon, um, but once that happened and once this exploit happened, what a lot of miners started doing was mining blocks and only filling it with gas token printing. And so you can see here, all most of these transactions are all 
zero transaction fee, meaning the miner uh, included his own transaction and he paid zero for it. And so he didn't have to pay a single dime for any gas and he got minted eight million gas worth of gas token, which is uh, if someone like you or me, or me were to do it, we'd have to pay the normal gas, uh, gas price. And so what we're seeing now is a lot of miners are actually basically filling blocks with, with uh, zero gas limit, or I'm sorry, gas price. And what's happening with that is it's, it's a win-win for the, the miner because they get gas tokens, but what happens is they also start clogging up the network because they're not propagating normal transactions. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why this is, could be a dangerous thing if you have all the miners are just including their own transactions for the gas token, they're not sending actual transactions through. Um, and this is a graph of the, the transactions of gas token. Um, I didn't put the line in here, but right around this time was DEPCON last year. And you can see that people started getting interesting, interested in it. Uh, Phil Diane had a great speech about uh, gas tokens and front running. Um, our uh, exploit uh, article came out about a month later. Uh, so I think a lot of people started recognizing it. And then uh, a little later on, it just kind of became a thing. And it, it looks like it's growing and it's going to become more and more ubiquitous. Um, it was also used, gas tokens were also used a little bit during the crypto kitties phase for arbitrage, like I explained earlier. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but there's a lot of articles on it that are, are super interesting. Um, it's also happening in, on ETH Classic. Uh, miners are also basically paying nothing and, and getting gas tokens. Uh, ETH Classic's a little more interesting, or a little interesting in a different way in that it's really cheap. Uh, for five dollars, you can basically print uh, tons and tons of gas tokens. Now, the, the proportionate price of ETH Classic versus ETH means that these aren't worth much or anything, and, and it doesn't totally matter that you, you don't need to pay much, but it, this is kind of showing that, hey, it is happening on ETH Classic, too. Um, the, like the Etherscan uh, page, this is an ETH Classic Explorer that shows the same thing with, with no, no gas payments and just gas minting. Um, and what's interesting is, is you can imagine this is an ERC-20 token, and so people can trade it. So this is an example of, of an exchange on ETH Classic. Um, and it's, it doesn't look like it's too highly used, but it is an exchange and people are trading gas tokens. Um, the price is the, it's an interesting market because you have an exchange. You can also mint the gas token over and so you, you can natively like, uh, price the token. You can also trade it. There's basically two different markets going on. Um, mainnet uh, on Ether, Ethereum doesn't necessarily have a marketplace at this time, though I did see right before this talk that there is a Uniswap uh, gas token marketplace. Um, so it's coming. I don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, th there's a good chance it might be removed. There's a whole concept of storage rent that, that may actually nullify all of this, but, but it's all in the future and, and we'll see if it actually happens. Um, finally, that there, there's a... Uh, package that you can just install and start running. Uh, it's called the gas token miner from Saturn Network and you click one button on your computer and it just starts minting gas token for you. You have to fund it obviously, but uh, it's, it's about as easy to mint gas token at this point as just clicking a button on your computer. So I think it's going to become more and more prevalent as time goes on. Um, this is more of a reference slide, but, but here's a few addresses that are currently arbitraging the network on different DeFi exchanges. Some of them are using gas token and if you want to see how people are using it, um, try to kind of look into these, these addresses and the transactions and how they, they process it because it's pretty complicated. A lot of transactions going on. I'm sorry, a lot of, a lot of calls are being made in one transaction. Uh, it, it's really, really fascinating, uh, but uh, it, it'll give you an insight to how this is actually being used. Um, finally, how to, to protect yourself. Uh, pay attention to your gas limits, like I showed with the, the mobile interfaces. If, if the app is abstracting away gas from you, it's uh, it's almost dangerous. It's almost more dangerous than knowing what you're getting into. So maybe it's more of a, a social thing about learning about this instead of, of abstracting it away. Um, transact with only trusted parties. This is hard. Uh, this is like saying only give money to your friends and not a merchant. Um, obviously, it's not realistic. But if, but if you do know that hey, I'm interacting with Uniswap and I know them to be good, there's a really good chance you're not going to get siphoned. Um, uh, when you're subsidizing costs, set a gas limit. If, if you do set a gas limit, uh, attackers can really not take much from you. If you have civil protection, like an email and username, it, it's really negligible. And so that, that is the best way to do it, but that's not always possible in crypto. 
Um, the last two are a little more interesting. Uh, look at all contract interactions and learn to code. It's not for everyone, um, but if you are playing in this space, there's a good chance that you're interacting with uh, potentially malicious code, and if you really don't know how to protect yourself, it's uh, it's hard. And learn to code doesn't mean like sit there and become a developer, but at least understand uh, the, the basics of what's going on. Uh, a very simple understanding could save you from a lot of this stuff. And maybe not even coding, but understanding the ecosystem around coding and, and where to look to see, hey, there might be an exploit that's not on uh, a news site or something. And so, so basically being more, more familiar with everything uh, is the point of those last two. Um, finally, you, you can look at these later, but there's uh, references here, and a lot of this, these slides came from this and, uh, and our own experiences back uh, about a year ago. So, thank you. Is there any questions? Yeah. Why did you cover the name of the exchanges? Because um, I don't know how they'd respond if they saw a talk with there them. There should be at least an informal way to you know who can ask for them. <laughs> you can look at the Etherscan transaction and it'll show you. Yeah. For the exchanges to protect themselves, is something more complicated than just setting the gas limit required? Yeah. Um, there's a few things uh, they all hold. So, for example, with Ethereum specifically, you can check if the interaction is going on with the contract. Um, and the exchange should probably assume, hey, I'm only interacting with a non-contract, and they can actually check that. Um, and a non-contract can't, can't do this stuff, but it, it, a contract can. So an exchange can check, hey, am I interacting with a contract? There are ways around it. Um, for example, if you deploy a contract and make the withdrawal in the same transaction, uh, it doesn't look like a contract at that point, um, but it, it's pretty far out there. Um, the gas limit is the best, but then that also gets into questions like what if a user is trying to withdraw into a contract uh, safely? And it, it, it's a really hard question, and we, I don't really know the answer. They could just charge you for what, your yeah. fees. They, they could charge you, and, and some exchanges actually charge a withdrawal fee that is greater than the amount of, of tokens that they mint, they could mint for you, and that is a really good answer. Um, but again, it, it, it's not the perfect answer. How good are the nodes at estimating the stuff? Because the nodes if you're running a node, you can go and estimate the gas kind of usage of a, fu a function call. How good are they at estimating whether or not the contract underneath, the gas token contract, is going to go and create X amount of data on chain? Um, I want to say it's, it's super easy. Um, sure. I just don't think people are doing it. OK, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that is a good answer. Uh, we got one more. Uh, yeah. So I know there's two different variants of gas token. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit about like when you would reach for either variant? Yeah. So uh, there, there's the, the deeper answer to that is go to gastoken.io. I think um, the the quick answer is there's two ways to get a refund on Ethereum. One is to uh, reduce state, so setting a variable from one to zero uh, collects this refund. Another way to do it is to self-destruct a contract. I think that's the more efficient way. And so if you basically create what Gas Token 2 does, it creates a thousand contracts for you. And when you go to use it, you just destroy the contracts. And that's the, the type of refund. So, but, but Gas Token.io, uh, they have a very, very in-depth uh, analysis of all of that. And I think that's all my time. Thank you.